man, I got a great interview for you today. I have a gentleman that worked on the Hemi engine who's also in charge of the Hurricane engine. Lots of years of experience working with engines and propulsion systems within Stellantis. This engine is going to be used in a new 2025 Ram 1500, also Dodge Charger, Grand Wagoneer, and Wagoneer, and maybe more. So if you look for details in this engine, what's going to be reliable, oil intervals, dipsticks, all that kind of stuff, make sure you pop top, sit back. It's going to be a fun interview. Hey, it's Tim, Pickup Truck Plus SGP Talk, joined by Alan Falkowski. Uh -huh. Been practicing this morning. Director Propulsion Component Release Center, which is probably the coolest name I've had anybody on the show so far. Uh, welcome, Alan. Thanks, Tim. I'm glad to be here with you this morning. Um, looking at my uh, massive notes I sent you, which is I was impressed I kept this much up. Uh, I'm going to start with the history first. Uh, we're going back in time. We're talking about the Ram 1500. It's got new Hurricane engines, which I sounds like you may know a thing or three about these engines. So I want to go back in time and talk about getting to this point. So when you knew the Hemi was going away, I'm sure you got a note from an executive that was 48 point bold, italicized, underlined, Hemi is dead, right? That's what you get. And then you knew that I was going to die. <laughs> so moving forward, you know, and, and I know you had some history with Hemi. I know you're part of that design team for the Hemi as well. Um, where do we, how do we get to this inline six idea? You know, not like a, a, a turbo four before or other options or a V6 as well. Yeah, sure. So first of all, no, we didn't get that. Uh, no, bold, not 48. 48 point. No, not at all. Um, really, as we look at what we have uh, in our, you might call it portfolio of engines, right? Um, at the time, you have to look at and understand what is its potential need, right? And for sure, it was we're going to be using this engine in trucks as a potential Hemi replacement. Um, so you got to start out with what's the real need for that application. Um, and a lot of that, I'll say, is driven by regulations. And that's kind of been true for engines for many decades, right? Regulations, sometimes those regulations are pretty obvious. What I mean by that is some regions, some countries will dictate the displacement of an engine, right? Hey, you got to be below this, otherwise you get taxed at different different rates. We don't have that here in the U.S., which is which is good, but we definitely need to try to determine what's its purpose, how's it going to be used, what are the um, objectives that you have to try to hit. So when you begin the process, it's like, well, we know we got to be better than what we had before. Right. Otherwise, why would you do this? Why would you go through all the effort? Um, so you can look at, and we did obviously the Hemi metrics, um, and based on that, we knew we need that to, to be better. Um, we need to make more power, more torque, right? Have better fuel economy. Those are the three key attributes that we had to go after. Um, and then you can work backwards from that and say, all right, well, we know in order to achieve those. We're going to have some potential strategies we could pursue. And what I mean by that is um, you could, and that's really the path we went down, use turbocharged engines, right? You can downsize them so that under most conditions, you've got a smaller engine. It's more fuel efficient. But when somebody really steps into it and they need a lot of power, now you can use that turbocharger to make that additional power. But, but in most cases, most customers don't need that. So we selected to use turbocharging. Um, and then you say, okay, here's how much power we need to hit. We know how much on a specific basis you can make. What I mean by that is with a turbocharged engine, you can make so many horsepower per liter. Okay, well, in order to get to these power numbers, what size does the engine need to be, right? And three liters, we knew we could get to the objectives we had to hit. Right? You don't need something as big as what we had with the Hemi. If you turbocharge that, it's much like the supercharged version we have right now, you get some really big numbers. And while they're cool to drive around in a Demon 170, um, it's really not practical for, for most customers. So you say, okay, here's three liters. What's the best way to try to package that? And historically, when we were having to package engines that were naturally aspirated and we needed big displacement to make those numbers, V engines made a lot of sense because it's a very efficient way to get as much displacement as you can. And if you needed uh, you know, a 6.4 liter inline engine, 
it gets pretty big. But now when we're talking about three liters, right, we can consider V engines, we can consider inline engines. Um, and we looked at those configurations. But at three liters, the length of the engine itself is short enough now that it can fit into the products we have. And there are inherent benefits to an inline engine. And that is primarily, especially an inline six, they're perfectly balanced, right? They're smooth. They feel great whether you're idling or you're racing it all the way up to red line, all the way through, there's no imbalance. And that's an attribute that we wanted to try to include um, in our new trucks because we've got our tungsten trim level, which is a basically a luxury truck, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to make that thing feel lux like a luxury product. And an inline six allowed us to do that. So that kind of steered us towards, okay, we don't think we need to do a V, we can do an inline six engine. And um, I'll say that's kind of the foundation of how you go about determining the size of the engine, the type of the engine and the arrangement. Hmm. That's interesting. And it's interesting that you pointed out that leaders matter for different countries and things. And being this is, I'm gonna assume you don't develop an engine just for the United States, you develop for global applications as well. You do, and there's certain thresholds um, for the displacements. And uh, historically, we've made some, uh, you might say, unusual combinations of displacements in order to meet those thresholds, um, because the regulations often require a sizable increase in taxes. And sometimes customers will make a decision. It's like, hey, if I got to spend another two thousand dollars for a product because it's two tenths of a liter over the regulation, they'll go buy a competitor's product that's $2,000 less, right? Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And for those that, that don't know, I mean, I just kind of, how long was the development in process? How long did, how long did these engines take to like, not start to finish, but you know, just the general ballpark when you, when you get the, that big memo. Yeah, that's something that I'll be honest, I don't want to give you a number. And the reason is everybody doesn't use the same, let's say, starting point. Okay. And everybody likes to brag, I can do it. It's kind of like the old name that tune. Uh, if you remember, I can name that tune in you know, two notes or three notes. Everybody likes to brag, hey, I can do it in less time. But what's not consistent is what's the starting point, right? And um, people will oftentimes pick artificial starting points to give you a short number, because then it seems like, hey, we're more efficient. Um, so I don't want to quote anything, but what okay. I'll say is that there's an evolution um, from um, some of our previous engines and we take and adopt some of the technology and the characteristics. And those are then brought into this newer hurricane engine or any engine we do. Um, and that certainly helps to compress the time. Um, what I will say is there has, because I've been doing this for several decades now, there has been you know, every time I do a new engine program, we get less and less time to do it in. Um, and it's been enabled by a number of things. Some of it is the, the tools that we have to design the engines. So there's a lot less prototyping involved. We can rely on the analysis tools to help guide us. Um, and then the type of equipment that we use to make engines now is um, CNC equipment. So they're standardized units that you need to program. Right. When I started doing this work on the Hemi engine, the, the third generation Hemi engine, we used what were called transfer lines. And that was dedicated equipment, dedicated machines. And an example is, you know, if you're putting um, bolts for your cylinder head or any, any component, um, you had to define the distance between those. And they would have to make a unique gearbox just to drill those holes one relative to the other. And that took time. It's a custom gearbox. It's a custom machine. Today, you buy a CNC machine and you can program the distance between those holes. And the really cool thing is um, we can tell them which much, with much less lead time what that distance needs to be, or we can even change it. Um, so there's been enabling factors that have allowed us to compress that time. Um, and I'm grateful for it, to be honest with you, as a somebody that, you know, designs and creates engines, the flexibility that gives us is enormous. Hmm. Yeah, I, I heard that other uh, designers, too, like the whole evolution of computer software and things has really sped up the development process for a lot of things. So let's let's talk about things that aren't sped up, and that's durability, right? So uh, there's 
always a big outcry. I've been doing this job over a decade, and I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to get 35 comments in this video about how turbos are unreliable. <laughs> and I, I, I can't get around that. It seems like that is the de facto viewpoint of every, not everybody, but a mass majority of customers that, oh my gosh, you went turbo. That means it's, it's not going to last over 100,000 miles. Yeah. So that's a fair, I'd say, historical perspective. And part of that, I think, stems from when we were using turbos, let's say in the 80s and the 90s, they were used by taking an engine that existed and we're going to bolt a turbo on it to make more power, right? It wasn't designed from the onset to be turbocharged. Um, and as a result, you did have some reliability issues with that. Um, but when you start from the very beginning with a, this is going to be a turbocharged engine, right? Much as I said, we figure out what's the horsepower going to be for this displacement. You can then determine what are the cylinder pressures going to be and what are the temperatures going to be at those boosted levels that you need. And so we take that information, we use those analysis tools and we figure out, well, what is the cooling requirement for the engine? What's the wall thickness need to be? What do we need to do with materials to make sure that it's going to be able to operate at those conditions? So I think the concern that people have is really rooted in the history of, yeah, we used engines, we used to bolt turbochargers on engines, but when you purpose design them for that, you can make a reliable product. And, and an example for that is, you know, turbochargers have been used on diesel engines for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Diesel engines are known for reliability, but when they were designing those diesel engines with turbochargers, they intended them to be boosted. And the methods and the tools and the techniques that were used to make those engines reliable at those boosted levels, we use them for gasoline engines that are turbocharged today as well. Hmm. Yeah, interesting stuff. So, um, and I know no automaker talks about durability in terms of miles because it gets legal and there's all sorts of concerns. And, oh, you said it's going to be this and it might not get enough or I got more than you said and, hot, you know, whatever deal. But I just wondered about the durability process. I don't want to dive too deep into this besides um, in, in the weeds and all these corporate behind the scenes stuff. But when, when you look at your durability testing and things, I mean, is it is it pretty rigid? What, what can a customer take away from this that says that, boy, I feel good that, you know, you guys have done a durability testing. Like, what's it? What's it look like? Yeah, what I'll say is it's um, it's based on the foundation of um, damage accumulation, and this is not just in the auto industry; it's in any industry. And the idea is, we need to represent and validate and come up with tests that the customer we, we need to accumulate as much we'll call it damage in a short time as what a customer would do over the life of that product right and this damage methodology is used as a normal tool um so what we do is and in the foundation I, I thought uh, how could i talk about this but the foundation is a paperclip example right if you and it's really related to fatigue. If you take a paper clip and you move it a whole bunch, you can maybe move it, you know, five times and it breaks, right? But if you just move it a little bit, you can spend days or weeks or months just moving it a little bit, right? It doesn't break. So mm, our customers, right, what we have to do is figure out how do they use their products and how much fatigue are they creating in their daily use and depending on the type of use. So we'll go out and we collect the data um, on how our customers use their products. And we can determine whether they are making a little or a lot of damage. And we add that up for the life of the product over the life of it, right? And we say, okay, here's how much damage is created. Now what we do is we develop tests that in a compressed amount of time, can create just as much damage. And the way we do that, to be honest with you, is we run the engines as hard as they can be run under all the conditions that they can be operated at. So we can demonstrate the full life of an engine in much less time because the majority of customers don't run their engines at peak power. In fact, if you look at over the life of an engine, most customers might be at peak power for about 30 minutes 
Um, yet we run our tests for hundreds of hours under those conditions um, to, in order to compress them in time. So it's really the foundation of damage, how much damage does the customer create? And we look at our worst case customers and we develop our tests to reflect that. And we test the engines to those conditions. Interesting. Uh, do you have that video queued up, by the way? I do. This so, is a video that was uh, presented at the media first drive event, and uh, it was pretty interesting. <laughs> Let's say it like that. Yeah. So let me uh, go ahead and share it here. Hang on a second, Tim. So that was the Hurricane engine running on a very aggressive, one of the most historic uh, racetracks in the world. Okay. <laughs> and so it was simulating not only the speed that the engine operates at and the power levels, but also the attitude of the engine. So that's a unique um, dynamometer, the gimbal type of dynamometer that we can simulate we call it critical oil level testing. So you can imagine as you are going around curves, the oil sloshes to one side, and we need to make sure that the engine's not being starved of oil. Um, and we also need to replicate the, the speed and the, let's say the demand of oil that the engine has. So it's a, it's a really cool test that we've been using now for a number of years to replicate the worst conditions that we can imagine our customers would ever be using their product in. And that's just one of the many tests that we validate the engines against. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting test. Definitely catches your attention when you're watching the video. It's like, <laughs> holy cow, I made a joke to you about the engine mounts not being bolted down quite right. And it's, yeah. it's in the gimbal. But uh, so, I mean, you're, you're, you're doing this durability testing, checking for oil and make sure the engine's not starved of oil, which is a key component of the engine, but also cooling. Cooling is such a critical part of turbocharged engines because I know we have lots of towing tests and things. We'll talk about more about that. But in, in, in regards to cooling, what have you done to help the turbo be as uh, last as long as it can? Because yeah. my understanding is turbos love cool air, but they want to run hot. And as you run things really hot, you got to keep them cool to keep them more efficient. Yeah, there's cooling on a number of levels here. Um, one of them is just what most people think of as, hey, I've got the radiator, the vehicle, and we need to make sure that it's able to reject all of the heat that the engine is able to produce. And uh, that is certainly something that's important, and especially under trailer tow conditions, because the trailer tow uh, standards that are out there that were published by SAE are for uh, basically going up a mountain in a desert. Right, the Davis Dam test for those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, it's just you spend a lot of time going up this mountain, in their hot conditions, and often the limitation of passing that test is how big of a radiator can you put on the vehicle, and what is the heat rejection of the engine in order to, you know, it's like the producer of heat is the engine, and the the radiator has to get rid of it all. So it's a balance and a matching really of those two elements. And what we've been able to do um, on the newer generation of turbocharged engines, and we were certainly sensitive to some of our competitors who launched earlier than us with turbocharged engines, people complained, hey, I get really bad fuel economy when I'm towing. And what you need to do in order to prevent that from happening is, you got to make sure that you don't have to retard spark. When you retard spark, fuel economy gets really bad. So in order to prevent that, you got to select characteristics of the engine, like the bore and the stroke ratio that suppress knock. You need to include technology like direct fuel injection at high pressures that can be used to suppress knock. And if you do those things, right, you don't have to retard spark and you don't have to get an increase in fuel consumption under heavy load. The additional benefit that you get from that is if you don't have to retard spark, you don't have to reject as much heat. And if you're not rejecting as much heat, 
you can tow more than what you may have been able to do previously on boosted engines. So it really comes down to knowing and understanding the physics and designing the engine around those physics. So that's the, the radiator heat the, and heat rejection that everybody's familiar with the cooling. There's another level of cooling that you got to talk about, and that's, we call it the low temperature circuit. So now we have um, a circuit that runs at a, a lower temperature than the main radiator. It's cooling a couple of things. One of them is the air that comes out of the turbocharger. You've got a heat exchanger now. The air from the turbo goes through that heat exchanger. We're using that low temperature circuit to cool it. That also helps to suppress knock. And the other benefit is, and this I'm gonna say goes back to some of the concerns people had about turbocharged engines reliability. We also use that low temperature circuit to cool the turbocharger, right? Keeping it cool. A lot of the, the failures that were associated with turbochargers from a long time ago were because you had oil coking, right? You use oil to cool them, but if you don't also use coolant to cool them, then you can have that oil coking. We're using this low temperature circuit to cool the turbocharger even after you shut the vehicle down. You turn it off, we still continue to, it's an electric water pump, we keep circulating it based on how you drove the vehicle before you shut it down and we'll continue to cool that turbocharger even after the vehicle shut off so that you don't get that coking. And that's another element that we've addressed related to let's say turbocharged engine you know, reliability. You're not gonna get that coking anymore. We know about it, it's, you know, it's managed by the low temperature circuit. Hmm. Yeah, that's going to make people feel good that there's uh, a cool turbo, like cool, cool, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm looking at uh, other things. So I know we talked about the towing, the J2807 standard, which if people don't know, it's a, it's a towing standard that all major automakers have now adopted. And they all basically run the same test, Davis Dam, and you have these parameters. And and like you've alluded to, I've uh, a lot of people still want to believe that the engine produces the towing numbers or the transmission does all this kind of stuff, but really this test is designed for cooling um, more than anything else. And that yeah. goes to reliability. All right, let's talk Ruby's favorite topic, oil. Mm. <laughs> People love, um, I did not understand, I did not understand this, that um, oil and the type of oil and the viscosity of the oil, the brisket of the oil, all that kind of stuff is such a hot topic on forums and on this channel until I started this YouTube channel and holy cow, um, I have heard a lot from people on oil. So let, let's let's just start basically. So what kind of oil do you recommend with the Hurricane engine? Yeah, so it's the latest standard of oil. Um, it's called a GF6. So the API Institute has different grades of oil and it's, you know, if you look on the backside of them, you'll see their little emblem. Um, it's the latest, standards that they have out there it's a full synthetic oil and um, depending on whether you're using the standard output engine or the high output engine we recommend two different grades right so for the standard output engine it's a zero w20 and for the high output engine it's the zero w40 and why is there a difference between them because the high output engine runs at higher boost pressures, higher cylinder pressures. And as a result, the pressure that's acting on the bearings is higher. And in order to protect them, you run with the 40 weight oil instead of the 20 weight oil um, because it helps maintain the oil film thickness that's needed for the bearing durability. Regarding, you know, what's the right, the best oil to use, um, full synthetic oils last longer. And that's one of the things that you've seen over time We've extend, been able to extend the oil change interval. Um, right now, the Hurricane engine is 10,000 mile oil change interval. If for any reason you are using the engine more aggressively than let's say normal, um, we have an oil change interval monitor that's always watching and it'll tell you, hey, wait a minute, you need to change sooner than that. Um, this I know is a topic that is debated out there and I can tell you uh, growing up, I. You know, and I still do all my oil changes. Um, but growing up, it was like, hey, every 3,000 miles, you know, change your oil. And I did that. Um, but the quality of the oils has dramatically improved since I was a 
teenager doing my oil changes. It's in, improved in um, a couple of ways. One is the base of the oil itself has improved, the synthetic oils, that's made a big difference. And then the additive packages that go into the oils are enhanced and they're far better than they ever used to be. Um, we work with the additive manufacturers and the oil manufacturers to make sure that the combination of the base oil and the package itself is going to be able to withstand, you know, the use that the customers are going to put their engines through. And they have, uh, over the years, evolved to, let's say, standardized tests with specific engines that everybody uses. And every time they come out with a new oil spec, they verify it against all the old ones so that, you know, there's no problem with some of the, the legacy engines. Um, but they also make sure that it is able to work and achieve some of the new objectives that we have. Um, one of them I'll tell you is um, for boosted engines, right? This, this latest specification, the oil itself helps to suppress knock that I was talking about earlier, right? They know that certain combinations of um, sulfurs in the oil can influence the amount of knock that we have. So they've adjusted the blend and there are limits on, on what's in the oil and that also helps to suppress knock. So uh, it's really important that you're using the latest oils in, in the uh, hurricane engines. Is that why historically, like throughout the years of the Hemi engine and different competitor engines, they've change the oil requirement that the, the oil recommend type because the oils have improved over the years for sure and you know i mentioned in this case knock but we've also seen some of the oil additives help with reducing wear of components as well um so as we have evolved and say the stresses on the components have increased um, in order to manage those increased stresses we have used additives that that are able to uh, address the the increased stresses that come along with that. And that's interesting because the, the vibe you hear online is, is that the new oils are going to make the engine wear out faster because they don't not as the cost. Yeah, of no, not at all. It's the science that goes behind the, the additive packages is pretty amazing. Um, I've, <laughs> if you go into the chemistry lab of some of these additive package manufacturers they're the some of the coolest ones you'll see in the world i'm serious they have tremendous capabilities to understand how these chemicals interact with one another and how they interact with the components of the engine there's there's a tremendous amount of science behind it um i've been blown away by what they're able to do hmm. Interesting. And you also talk about this oil life monitor. I had this situation come up. I buy a new truck every year. And I've seen this happen more and more that automakers are moving away from a dipstick, basically. And they're getting away from the dipsticks and going right to oil intervals instead of checking your oil. And we've seen that in transmissions. And now I'm seeing this in engines as well. Do you think that that is a good thing? Is it fine? Is it taking some of the concerns away from customers? Or where are we at? Well, yeah, we haven't at Stellantis. Uh, we still actually. We're, we're, we're monitoring the oil with an oil level sensor. Okay. So it's not like we have abandoned any idea of what's happening. Actually, we're watching it because in most cases, I mean, people never check their oil level, right? Um, we do have a sensor in its place instead, and it's always watching. And if for any reason it falls below the threshold, it's going to tell you, right? So it's actually better um than what we had in the past so i understand with transmissions a lot of times they have their you know fill for life that's not the case with engine oil we know you're going to have to change it um so it's Atlantis on on our newer products we're using an oil level sensor that's always there always watching and it'll do a better job protecting the engine than than us lazy humans did whenever we never check the, the indicators i check the oil all the time sir i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> Um, let me ask you another question about uh, break-in process. So this has been a topic that's come up. And I wonder if this is a little bit old school. There used to be a thing called break-in oil. It was a different type of oil that came from factory, and you would change it within the first 1,000 miles or so as a break-in oil. So uh, where are we at these days with break-in process on engines? Yeah. Um, if you look in the owner's manual, I, in fact, I, should, I think there's some verbiage in there. It's like, you know, don't hammer on your engine for the first short little bit of time. 
but there's no really requirement to change the oil. Um, and that's because of a number of factors. One, as I said before, the oils are much better than they ever used to be. Um, secondly, is the rings, the piston ring geometry, the finish that we put on the cylinder bores has evolved over time. And um, the, you don't have a lot of particles of debris that are produced as they break in. There's really no break in required. In fact, one of our tests that we validate our engines against is you take a green engine, and I mean a green engine, and you go wide open throttle, and you do this on engines that are at hot conditions, and you do it with engines that are at cold conditions, just to make sure that all of the, and we do it at the worst case tolerances as well. So under the worst case conditions, you're never going to seize an engine. So that's already addressed. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'll, I'll say for this hurricane engine is not only did everything I say uh, exist for it, but we have, instead of using a traditional cast iron liner cylinder, we have a, um, we call a spray bore liner. It's essentially like welding steel on the inside of the aluminum block to create the liner. And that is a much harder surface. Um, and we, rely on the porosity that exists there to help hold the oil as opposed to historically we would use the honing pattern to help hold oil and migrate oil we don't need to rely on that anymore um, so the liner itself is smoother than it's ever been it's pretty amazing when you look at a new liner they're smooth and they don't wear because they're harder so a lot of times you know we tear the engines well we always tear them down after test but it's pretty incredible when you look at a, you know, an engine that's completed its full durability test and a new engine, there's almost no change in the condition of the liner. So um, again, further, let's say debris that might be coming off as a part of the break-in process. Um, so really no no need to change your oil on the engines. Yeah, I've actually sent my oil into uh, Blackstone Labs over the years. Mm. And they're always laughing at me. They're like, you have 8,000 miles. Like, you, <laughs> like, like there, there's nothing. There's it, It's totally fine. Right. It, it is interesting. So I got a couple of last things for you. I, I've been dying to ask this question. I, I haven't got around to different engineers I interviewed on the panel. It's about the start-stop systems and starter reliability. Hmm. So I, I actually Googled this the other day. And a start-stop engine, which is where, if you don't know, you pull up to a stop sign or a certain driving condition, waiting for my kids to get out of school, whatever, put in park, the engine will turn itself off and save fuel while we're sitting there. Uh, sometimes it will be overridden by different climate needs, like if you have the heat on the cabinet deal. But it was like 1990 or something, the first start-stop engine came out. And so it, this is not new, new technology, but there's a still a lot of concern about the starter because you're asking the starter to turn itself on, turn it off. My understanding is engines don't mind being turned on and turned off. It's really the components around it, the starter, turbos, things like that. So what do you think about the starter? I mean, it, it, I, I'm guessing it's not the same size as my 1996 Chevy Cavalier. <laughs> I hope with one hand, right? I mean, these starters, I understand these starters these days are much more advanced they're they're bigger they're beefier yeah and uh you know I'll, I'll admit i'm not an expert on starters so i did reach out to um some of the folks at stellantis to get that background and what we've done is to upsize the starters right um so the the size of the motor itself has been increased um the number of brushes inside of the motor has been increased so that the current that um, is flowing through them and let's say the amount of wear that that creates over time is less. So they can last longer and effectively the starters are um, validated to, you know, we used to have our pre start stop, you know, durability schedules in life and that damage that I talked about. The, the tests today and the starters today um, are designed and validated against six times what we used to use as our acceptance tests in the past. And that is in, there's another safety factor on top of that in that um, those tests assumed that you were like cold cranking your engine and it took a while to start, right? Um, in these start stop situations, whenever you, you don't, but the, the vehicle shuts down the engine, right? We monitor exactly the rotate number of rotations of the crank, where it stopped, and we know when is going to be the next cylinder that can fire, okay? And the reason why we do that is 
on a restart, the starter starts to crank the engine, right? But the very next cylinder that can fire with direct fuel injection, we squirt the fuel in there and we fire that cylinder. So the engine itself does most of the starting then under those conditions, right? The starter itself has only got to get it turning to the point where the next cylinder can be fired off. So the amount of, let's say, effort and work that goes into what the starter's got to do on a restart is much less than on cold cranking conditions. So not only do they have six times the number of, you know, cycles that they've validated against, all these restarts that they're validated against, or let's say, during a restart, the effort required by the starter is a fraction of what it is. So um, I think they've been able to address the durability issues, and, and we've not seen any significant problems from a durability perspective with start-stop systems. Yeah, I, and that's the thing I throw back to people. I have not seen uh, many reports. Like, there's not been many recalls. Carcomplaints.com doesn't have reports on this. You know, there's a variety of other issues, but as far as uh, using technology issues these days is the culprit of most reliability. Oh, my phone won't connect to my truck, and it's a terrible truck now. Uh, I, see that, yeah. I see that all the time. So yeah. uh, final one for you, fun one. I know you are never online. You're never on forums. You never read any comments. No, wait, you probably do. <laughs> so what is what is one thing that over the t over the years has changed a lot in technology, but you still see out there that kind of is like, wow, you know, I wish this would just go away or wish that people would stop worrying about this so much? Oof. You know, I, I know this isn't going to be different from what we talked about. It's, it's really the oil change intervals. Um, Okay. You, know, you don't need to change it that often. You can't imagine one of the other things that we do with the engines today that we didn't do a good job in the past. That is, in order for the oil to last long, you have to remove the gases from the crankcase, right? That's the damaging part of it. Um, and we have advanced our ventilation systems. You know, if you go and look at some of the old engines that just vent out into the atmosphere, uh, not allowed to do that anymore, which is good, right? But in addition to that, what we are doing is we are making sure that we flush out the engine crankcase of air. There's fresh air that's drawn in, and the, the gases that are coming off are sent back through the combustion process. And as a result, um, the life of the oil has increased dramatically. Uh, it's pretty cool. We, we, we actually run um, computational fluid dynamics, right? You got the pistons going up and down inside the engine and we simulate what's happening inside the crankcase and the air that's going around and where it's going to make sure that we are drawing and flushing that out. And when you do that, the oil can last even, I mean, the the rig, the 10,000s a week mile that we recommend, um, it's a very safe number. So that's probably one thing that over the years, I think, persists of, hey, let's change the oil frequently. And, you know, uh, it, it's no, there's no harm in doing that, but it's really not required. No waste. Where you go, uh, Alan says the engine lasts 2 billion miles and never change oil. There we go. That's the details <laughs> for you on this hurricane. Thanks, Alan, for joining me today on this video. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. All right, there you go. There's the details I got from Alan on the new engine. What stood out to you? What surprised you? I know you're ready to make a comment. Here's your chance. Go ahead and fire them off down below. I'll make sure to read those. And by the way, I don't have Alan's personal information, emails, that kind of stuff. I don't want it. I work with the PR teams to schedule these interviews. So if you email me, I will probably just forward it on to them. By the way, I do get those emails. Uh, I have a bunch of engineer interviews as well on this channel. Make sure you check those out there. <laughs> I'll put them over there. Uh, other videos as well, and check out the forum at Pickup Truck Talk and the website. Uh, a lot of the questions come from the forum, by the way. Uh, make sure you and be a member over there. As always, thanks for watching. I will see you down the road.